Okay, so the recording has been started. Thank you all so much for coming to our bi-weekly COVID-19 meetup and check-in. Um, my name is Amelia. I'll be facilitating the meetup today. Um, just as a reminder, because I know that we have a couple of new names on here, um, if you would like, the session is being recorded. Um, so you can unmute yourself and talk at any point during the webinar, but you're also more than welcome to just use the chat box if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to, uh, to contribute. So our agenda for today is uh, we'll start with our three deep breaths again, um, take a little bit of time to center and breathe. And then we'll talk a little bit about some COVID data stuff. Uh, this is a continuation of a conversation that ha happened at the last meetup. So just a few more details on how COVID data is collected and the like. Um, then we're gonna talk about positive cases at the library um, and what your all's experiences with this has been. Um, and then possibly talking through some hypothetical situations. And then we'll also talk about some new resources and announcements. Um, as always, this is not meant to be a prescriptive agenda. You can totally jump in with any other questions or any other topics that you'd like to bring forth to the group. But the first thing to start with is three deep breaths. And I figured since I'd mentioned my cat so many times in these webinars, um, I'd show you pictures of them. So the one with the bandana is my cat, Pocky, and the one in the fruit tart bed is um, couscous. <laughs> so just channel some cat energy as we do some three deep breaths. Um, so sit up straight in your chair, uh, put your feet down flat on the ground if you can, um, straighten up your spine, lift your heart up, and if you can, you can either put your hands on your heart or you can do cactus arms if you would like, and we will do three deep breaths. So inhale, Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. And exhale. Awesome. Um, and Abby says that one of our islands is on fire, uh, which is alarming. <laughs> I hope it's a contained fire. <laughs> um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is the COVID data discussion. So like I said, this is a continuation off of a question from last session uh, where someone was talking about why there are sometimes discrepancies between uh, what local county health departments display for COVID cases and positive cases, um, and then the statewide map and why there's sometimes a discrepancy there. And so if you want more specifics on how exactly the COVID data is collected in Montana, you can actually look at this link, um, the COVID19MT.gov frequently asked questions, and they have some information there about the process for collecting data. Um, but the main thing for Montana, and I imagine also for other states, is that there's always a cutoff period um, for local health departments to submit data into the system, talking about positive cases, um, suspected cases, tests that are being done. And that's just in order to make sure that, you know, because this is an ongoing situation, um, you can always collect more and more data, but just at like 5 p.m. each day, that's not necessarily when the cutoff is, but at 5 p.m. each day, the state system just collects everything and presents things as is. So sometimes there's a discrepancy because they might have input something into the local system, but they have not yet forwarded on to the state system. Um, and so that's why there's sometimes different numbers displayed. Um, so sometimes it takes a little bit longer on the local level to do verification, to do contact tracing, to get all the information that the state system requires. And that's why there's a little bit of delay in there. Um, another question that came up last week was about the new hospital data system that um, the White House implemented 
I believe it was on July 10th. I can't remember the exact date. Um, but the White House, so previous to, I think it was July 10th, the CDC had been using their, their system um, to track hospital information related to COVID. Um, so that was stuff like um, cases, people who are coming into the hospital with COVID, the number of ICU units that are available, the number of ICU beds that are occupied, um, and just general hospital data related to COVID treatment and COVID tracking. Um, so after July 10th, the White House instituted a new system that bypasses the CDC and asks hospitals to directly submit data to this new White House system. Um, and so at this point, it's kind of hard to determine whether or not one system is better per se, but there was a lot of criticism over this decision because it happened in the middle of the pandemic. I think hospitals were given maybe two days to implement this new system, and there wasn't really a whole lot of training or guidance or really explanation as to why they decided to switch to a new system when the old system had been in place for decades and that hot, that relationship with the various hospitals had been in um, place with uh, and seemed to be working fine. So the jury's still out on that whole issue, but someone had, was wondering whether or not CDC data was still accurate because of the delay in switching to a new system, getting people trained on this new system, and whether or not it was still a reputable source to direct people to. Um, and so I actually did a little bit of, of looking into this. And so the CDC cases in the US page, that case count is accurate. Those case counts are taken from state and local health departments. Um, and so that is still a reputable source of information on COVID cases in Montana. Um, COVID is a required notifiable disease. So that means that doctors are required to report positive cases that they have to the health departments, um, which is separate from hospital reporting. Um, the only thing is that the CDC only collects confirmed positive cases. And so depending on the state and depending on the local health department, some places collect suspected cases in addition to the confirmed positive cases. So there are sometimes discrepancies there um, because the CDC only takes the for sure confirmed positive and other places report suspected cases in addition to the confirmed positives. So that's where you might still see some discrepancies um, with the case counts. The significance of the new hospital data system is that um, the hospital data is oftentimes uh, sort of a way to tell how well um, people are responding to, to a pandemic and to, to disease control and, 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 and prevention. Um, and so by looking at ICU data, by looking at how many people are getting treated, how many people have super severe or mild or no symptoms, that's a way for, for people to track how well are we doing in fighting COVID. Um, so that's the significance there. So I've included this NPR um, article here that you can take a look at. There's a lot of other stuff that's being written, but um, I just wanted to let you know that the CDC cases in the US page is still a, an accurate source of information, as well as um, I know a lot of people have been using the Johns Hopkins um, map, and that is also an, an accurate um, source of information and unaffected by the new reporting system. So let me actually go ahead and drop both of these links into the chat box. Um, but if you have any questions about this, please do let me know. I hope that I explained things <laughs> clearly. It took a little bit of time for me to wrap my head around it. Um, but there is a ton of information, a lot of discussion happening about this online. Um, so I encourage you to take a look there and see what's happening too. Any questions about this?
And Heather had a comment that local health departments do not always know about cases within their county if they occur on a reservation and there are jurisdictional issues. So that's also a really good point too, if you have, um, yeah, jurisdictional issues like that. Okay, so moving onwards, we're gonna talk next about positive cases at the library. Um, and uh, before I started this recording, there was actually some discussion about um, the Billings Public Library and how there was a reported positive case there. And so the library actually closed as a result, um, which is fairly recent news. I think uh, someone said it was reported about yesterday. Um, so if someone has more information about that and would like to talk about that, uh, please feel free to do so. But I did want to bring your attention to this resource from the Michigan State Library that is a sample positive case protocol policy. So this is not meant to be prescriptive in any way, but if this is something that you're, um, hopefully no one will have to deal with this, but in, in the case that you do have a positive case and staff or, or a patron in your library, um, this is an example of um, actions that you can take in terms of, of notifying people in terms of your organization's reaction. Um, so obviously this is not a one size fits all, but hopefully this is a good starting point and can bring up some questions for you to consider in your own organization and see what you all are comfortable with. So I'm gonna put this PDF in here and you can take a look at that. Um, but I wanted to see if there were any libraries who have dealt with this um, situation as of yet, where there's a positive case on your staff or someone in the library, um, and whether or not how exactly you reacted to that and what the process was with the health department or, or anything like that. So obviously, please only share if you are willing and, and able to share. I know that this sometimes deals with private issues, but um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, um, please do or comments, please do let me know. And Jennifer said, we had a scare of one, but it turned out not to be towards the beginning of opening. Um, and I'm glad that happened, Jennifer. And I'm glad that people were able to realize that it wasn't a positive case. And I think if we have, I was talking briefly with, if, Janet is on the call. I know Janet, you had said that maybe somebody had been exposed and so you guys were waiting to see. And um, yeah, if you wanna talk a little bit about that, feel free to um, in terms of if you just had that employee work from home or if you had someone um, from the health department come or anything like that. Um, and Jennifer, if you have any similar experiences, please feel free to to share too. And also if anyone just has any questions. Um, Beth in the chat said that the Billings Public Library just closed up. I can link to a news article if you like. They had one IT staffer test positive and closed the library. And yes, Beth, if you could link that, that would actually be great. And Marla just shared a link um, for, I'm guessing another um, uh, protocol policy. So feel free to take a look at that. And Jennifer said, if someone gets a, a symptomatic test, do they have to isolate until they know they have it? Um, I think in general, I think if people have known exposures, it is highly recommended that people isolate until their test comes back negative or positive. Um, I think that's been the standard recommendation from health departments uh, and from contact tracers when they are following up with people. So this is Amy and I actually have firsthand knowledge of that. Um, if you are in contact with someone who tests positive, at least in Gallatin County, they will call you and tell you, talk to you about it. And they ask you when your last date of contact with that person was, and they want, and then they'll tell you a day when your quarantine is over, um, whether you've been tested or not. So. Mm -hmm. 
even if you if you're asymptomatic even if you don't get tested they want you to stay quarantined if you've been in contact with someone who is positive mm. thanks for sharing amy yes um, <laughs> And then Beth also just shared a Billings Gazette report uh, or article um, about the library closing. Yes, and sending good vibes to Billings. And then Jennifer said, what if you haven't been around someone who has it and get the test done? Um, Oh, so you're, you haven't been exposed per se, but you're just curious to see if, if you have it or not. Um, I think in general, I mean, in general, there, you know, there's still social distancing in place and no one should really be spending copious amounts of time with people that they aren't, you know, outside of their family unit or, or main living unit or whatever. Um, so I think in general, I think you sh it's just better to be careful and to limit your physical exposure to other people overall. Um, but especially if you're getting a test, um, I feel like sometimes, I feel like sometimes people get tests just to be tested. Although it does not sound like a fun test. I hear they really shove that swab up in your Oh, in your don't nose. go scaring people. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. This, this is this is Joe, and I I I know here on the Blackfeet Reservation they really want encouraged um, asymptomatic people who had no known exposures to get tested, and they they were trying to get an accurate um, picture of what kind of exposures there were on the reservation, and so um, everybody was encouraged to go and get tested for about a gosh all, almost all of July. And, um, and it's, if you don't have a known exposure and you don't have any symptoms and you go and get tested, that doesn't make you more likely to get the disease, of course. So, mm -hmm. um, so you can, but you should still practice all your regular social distancing and, mm -hmm. and precautionary stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'd like Amy was saying, my husband has had a couple of potential exposures. And so he's had, he's had the test and, um, and we, he completely isolated immediately and until he had a, a negative come back. So um, that's, I, that's what we did anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the test is a little uncomfortable, but it's, it's not any worse than, you know, getting a shot or when they do a swab of your throat when you're little. So. Mm. Um, and Janet had said, uh, my daughter, who is a fragile diabetic and living with me, was exposed. It took forever to get results back, but she turned out negative. She did have to self-quarantine for two weeks, but our health department said that I did not. But my coworkers were not comfortable with me going to work, even with a mask, so I was quarantined as well. I was tested, but still haven't heard results, but presume I am negative as well, so very frustrating. Um, and yes, as I think we mentioned before, there has been a bit of a delay sometimes with test results because of the massive quantity of testing that's been happening. So um, it's kind of hard when you're, you get tested and then you don't get results back for a while because, you know, who knows if you may have been exposed in, in that time. So that's also sort of a difficulty that I've, I was reading about in, in other states too. Um, but and I, I know in the rural hospital that my husband works at that they have limited testing supplies again. Mm -hmm. So um, they're not encouraging the kind of widespread testing that they were a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So you might get, you know, if you are concerned about it, you might get um, a, doc a doctor or a health department say, no, you're not at big enough risk for us to test you because right mm -hmm. now they're having a little shortage on testing supplies. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or, oh, Laura said, I've heard of false positives coming up. Does anyone have any information on how often this is happening? Um, there are articles out there about um, the, the reliability of the testing. There are also known false negatives with testing. So um, 
you know, I think you, I, I mean, I haven't read any, any recently, but you can, if you look, you can find um, uh, articles in medical journals and stuff about, about that. So I have heard about both po false positives and false negatives, as Laura is saying, mm -hmm. but I don't have, you know, maybe we can find something on that. Yeah, and maybe I'll put that down as a topic for our next check-in and look up some stuff about that. So this is Nancy. I had somebody come into the library the other day and they had to have everybody tested in their company. And so everybody came back positive and then the test came back as contaminated positives. And so mm. then they retested them and they were all negative but everybody in the company originally it, it's on the paperwork i guess and i honestly I'm, I'm just listening to somebody who came in and told me they said it was considered a contaminated positive hmm. yeah well I, if you guys have any resources about this if you're doing your own research please feel free to send them to me and i can include them in um the next COVID meetup and I'll also be doing some research and, and looking around to see what's out there as well. Um, but yeah, I guess it does sound like it happens for both false positives and false negatives, which is unfortunate. Um, Jennifer said, I know someone who is in the hospital in Billings with COVID-19 from Eastern Montana with pneumonia, who just found out last night, um, which that's tough. I hope that they recover from both of those things. Um, and then Marla said, is there any antibody testing in Montana and is it reliable? And Heather said that they are antibody testing when you give blood. Um, so go get blood and get your antibodies tested. <laughs> There's apparently a big shortage right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did not know that. So yeah, you can contribute and get tested as well. Um, and let's see, uh, Beth said I donated blood on July 24th and got the results pretty quickly. Negative. Yay. <laughs> um, so yeah. Any other questions about this particular topic? And if you all find other positive case protocol policies or, or things around that, nature, please do let me know and I can add it to the COVID guide. I did add the Michigan State Library, this link here um, to the reopening guide. So you can take a look at it there if you like. And it's also in the chat box if you need it. Um, so at this point, I think those are most of the main topics that were scheduled for today. Um, so we'll go over some new resources and announcements and then we'll just have open discussion for anything else that you guys would like to discuss. Um, so the first thing is that fall workshops is happening November 17th through 18th online. Um, Joe, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that. I just wanted to let people know about the date and that you should come. <laughs> Y'all come, yeah. <laughs> It'll be a blast. I, I, uh, registration will open October 1st and we do plan to limit registration for for each session even though it is online because they're still going to be extended sessions so there'll still be like three hours with a break or two breaks and your your highly interactive and participatory should be a lot of fun different than a regular you know webinar that you can just sit back and listen to <laughs> so um, choose wisely and I, we've got some really great presenters from out of, out of state that got I've been kind of working with my colleagues in other states and found some people that we probably couldn't get here in Montana any other way but online so I'm pretty excited I'll be yeah. sharing more soon awesome I Thanks never like to share until I have people in their contract and I'm in the process of doing that right now so don't, don't want to jinx it <laughs> it's probably a good policy <laughs> Very superstitious. <laughs> um, so yeah, more information about fall workshops will be coming out later, but please do note these dates in your calendar and please attend um, anyone who is interested. 
Um, additionally, I was so excited about this. I listed this twice, I just realized, uh, but there is a COVID-19 meetup for school librarians that we have planned for next Tuesday. So that is August 11th at 9 a.m. Um, for right now, we just have one school librarian session planned um, just to see what people's concerns are, what questions give people a space to chat with each other. We're thinking that by the 11th, a lot of schools will have their reopening plans posted, hopefully. Um, so, you know, at that point, the librarians can, can talk and, and discuss logistics and, and questions or concerns that they have. Um, so that will be available. You can, of course, attend live. Um, and if you know of a school librarian, uh, please do feel free to forward this to them. Um, anybody is welcome. And it will also be recorded. So if they aren't able to make it at 9 a.m., they can definitely watch the recording afterwards. Um, and as I said, we only have one session scheduled so far. But at that session, we're planning on discussing if we should schedule future um, meetups for school librarians. Um, so if you know of anyone who would be interested in that, any school librarians who would like to connect with their peers across the state, please feel free to forward that to them. And let me actually grab that and put it in the chat box. Uh, a couple things in the chat box. Uh, Jennifer said that we still have people who are not wearing masks. Um, Heather said, our county is right on the bubble. So yesterday we didn't have to wear masks. Today we do, most people are just wearing them. And then Nancy said, I read an article today that the US Census Bureau has changed their mind and are shortening the October deadline to September 30th. Montana is trying to keep the extension because of COVID. Anyone hear something different? So do we change our info pushing? And that's a good question. And that's um, a Joe question, I think. And I am looking at, um... I, 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 just, I was away most of the day today, but I'm looking at an email and let me get back to you on that, Nancy. I'm just going to read through. I got an email from the state um, complete count committee person and chairperson. So let me see what she has to say about that. And I'll let you know. Yeah, I heard that article was on NPR. So it sounded like it was pretty legitimate. And I didn't know any more than that. No more than you at this moment, but I'll see what I can find out. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, Nancy, for bringing up that important detail. Um, the next thing on this slide is the Realm Project. So round four testing has been announced. And the Realm Project, for those of you don't know, who don't know, is reopening um, archives, libraries, and museums. And it's a research project between OCLC, uh, Web Junction, I believe, IMLS, and Battelle. And Battelle is a research group company um, and they are testing different materials um, and the attenuation of the COVID virus on different materials in typical library settings. Um, so they've just finished with round three and announced those results and they've just announced the different materials, five new materials that they are testing for round four. So I just put that into the chat box. You can take a look there and read a little bit more about them. Um, They've done a pretty great job at selecting various kinds of materials. So like board books, glossy paper magazines, um, your typical book, buckram, et cetera, et cetera. And now they're also starting to play around with um, different physical configurations. So like books that are um, stacked as opposed to books that are open, books that are in, on a shelf, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can take a look at that there and see what exactly they're testing. Um, and um, in general, they, they, do, they post quite a few updates on the Realm Project Hub. So you can just bookmark that and, and check back with it and um, see what's happening with that project. Uh, Laura asked, will the Realm session be recorded for those who can't watch at that time? And yes, Kara said yes. Um, and Jennifer also said, we have gone to four days of quarantine. Um, and that is in round three, they actually found that with many materials, 72 hours was enough in a typical office 
environment for the SARS virus to be, or the COVID virus to um, attenuate to, you know, undetectable levels. Um, but there were certain materials, I believe it was a kind of paper, a glossy paper, magazines, yes, that took four days to do so. Um, so if you want to find out more about that, go to the Realm Project, read the test three, round three test results, and you can make that decision for your library. Um, and Laura said that Missoula has also gone to four days of quarantine. And then there's another resource on here, the Realm Project Overview Webinar. Um, and I will put this link into the chat box too. And this webinar actually happened this afternoon. Um, and it was extremely popular. They originally had um, registration on Web Junction and then they had to do a live stream. Um, but this talked just so it was a big, it was a great overview of the realm project and what Battelle was actually doing and why they made certain decisions to format the project in the way that they did. Um, they talked, uh, I only caught the first half, but they talked a lot about the lit literature review that they did, um, where they analyzed all of the um, COVID information that was coming out. Their first lit review was in May, I believe. Um, and so there was um, a lot of there was a lot of information coming out and there was a lot of testing, but there were a lot of variations between the tests. And so Patel kind of consolidated everything together and they tried to standardize things um, and also make it relevant to what the kinds of situations that libraries, museums and archives would find themselves in. Um, so I would encourage you to watch this webinar. It gave me, it gave me personally a, a better understanding of why they've set up the the research project the way that they did how they're actually conducting the research um, they have people who are doing the research actually talking and explaining their process um, so it was it was pretty interesting um, and um, yeah so if you're interested in doing that they should make the recording available on that web junction page um, and I'll be sure to let you all know in the future if they have more webinars like this. Um, and Mitch says uh, that was detectable. There was the whole thing about the LOQ. The problem is that no one knows the infectious dose. And Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I think you went to this webinar. The infectious dose is like how much exposure, how much, how many viral particles you need in order to be uh, infected with the virus. Um, so they know that there's like a tipping point where like you get enough exposure, you have enough viral load, you will get COVID, but I think people don't know what that number or point is. Um, Susie said, I feel like there is also more information about the low likelihood of transmission through touch. There was an Atlantic article called The Scourge of Hygiene Theater. Are we spending too much effort cleaning? Um, which is a, is a valid question. Um, and I don't know if they addressed that in the webinar, um, but Susie, if you'd like to share the Atlantic article, um, I can include that when I send out these resources uh, on Wired. Um, and Joe said about the shorter deadline from the 2020 census, I have a copy of a letter from Governor Bullock to Wilbur Ross, the US Secretary of Commerce in opposition to the shortening of the deadline. I will forward a copy to everyone on the census champions list. If you are not on that list and want to view the letter, let me know. And you can just email joe at jflick at mt.gov. Um, and Mitch said, yes, the um, infectious dose is how many, how many at which point half the people exposed to that many will be infected. Um, so yeah. I believe that is everything on this page. Um, as I said, the round four testing materials have just been announced. And typically they announce things at the beginning of the month and then they release test results at the end of the month. So I'm guessing at the end of August, there will be um, test results that are released. And I think they're doing five rounds of testing total. If that is incorrect though, please let me know. <laughs> Uh, and Susie just shared the Atlantic article if people want to read that in the chat box. 
And Nancy said, what is everyone doing for story hour come this fall? What are the guidelines for this age? So if anyone would like to respond to that, feel free to. Um, and then the last slide on here is uh, COVID-19 reflection. And so some of you have actually already responded to these threads, but we have these various discussion threads going in our community forum. Um, and it'd be really helpful to us if people fill these out. Um, and you can fill these out multiple times because as we know, these, the situation has changed drastically from month to month as, as this pandemic goes on. So there's a general lessons learned thread, um, PR and communication, staffing, collections, safety, and programming. So if you have any questions or just thoughts or just, you know, I wish we had done this or this is something that I learned from this experience, please do feel free to share it in these COVID-19 discussion threads um, and it'll be super helpful for us in the future. So I'm gonna actually toss those in. And I see that there are things in the chat box, but I'm gonna, I'm bad at multitasking, so I'm gonna put these in first. And then I will get to the comments in the chat box. Okay, so Susie said, we are still only doing online programming. We do not plan on having in-person programming until we are well into stage three. Heather said, we have been holding story hour. The leader wears a mask until it's time to read and kids five and older wear masks. Laura said, is there any information in Realm about the viability of virus droplets in a circulating air system? For example, how long the air we are rebreathing in the building may be infectious. Um, and I think, Laura, when I had to sign off the webinar this afternoon, they were beginning to talk about that. Um, but I think there's been a lot of, it's one of those areas where there's been a lot of variables in testing this. So it's hard to make, to draw conclusive results because the way that different experiments have been set up have been so different. Um, I'll try and find some more information on this as well, because I think that's actually probably a, a pretty prominent question <laughs> for many people. Um, so if anyone has any information on that, feel free to chime in as well, but I also will try and do some more research too. Um, Kara said, Laura, they published a lit review, but are not testing this. Um, so yeah. And even if Realm isn't doing this, maybe there are other places that are, are testing this because Realm definitely is super library focused, but I think air breathing is a thing that many people do outside of libraries. So I think this is probably an area of concern for more people. <laughs> Mitch, do I need a citation that people breathe air? <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, I think that's all that I have in the PowerPoint today. We still actually have 15 minutes. I think this is one of the first times that we've ended early. So if you need to head out, feel free to. Um, I'm gonna stay behind and if there's any other questions or comments that people would like to bring forth, please feel free to do so at this point. Otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I will be sending out all of this information on Wired as well as the recording and the links that people have shared. Um, and just as a reminder to me, uh, air breathing and um, viral load in the air is something I need to research, as well as there was something else that I can't remember. Do, 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 do. Well, someone remembers for me. I, I think it's in the chat box, so I'll go back and look for it there. <laughs> I don't remember either. <laughs> oh gosh, I remember I said like, oh, I'll, I'll do some research on that. Um, but I don't remember what it was. Was it on testing? Oh, false positives and false negatives. Okay. Yeah, and antibodies. And antibodies, yes. Yeah, it just came to me at the, just as you said that. So. <laughs> uh, it was only for like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Go 
comes, it goes. Uh, it does. It does indeed. <clears throat> Let's see, I actually might go ahead and stop the recording for now as well.